Hello everyone, my name is David and you're listening to As the Pokeball Turns. Welcome, everyone, to the episode of As the Pokeball Turns, a Pokemon Go podcast where we discuss news, events, and other topics around Pokemon Go. Today, I'm happy to introduce the very first episode of a segment I like to call Trainer's Eyes. Trainer's Eyes is a series where we get to hear from you, the community, on how your Pokemon journey started, where it has been, and where it is going. The name Trainer's Eyes is inspired by a function on the Poking app from the Ruby and Sapphire games, where it would include details about trainers you battled in the games. The idea behind Trainer's Eyes is that we can listen and learn just how diverse our stories are in Pokemon Go. Do you PvP? Do you Shiny Hunt? Do you collect Pikachu? Are you maybe a leader in the community? Anything and everything is possible in this series, and I'm excited to finally introduce it. For your reference, moving forward, I'll have trainer's eyes in big brackets and it'll all be in caps, so you know this episode will be a trainer's eyes episodes. They will be standalone episodes, so there won't be no news or updates, no matter what it is, in this episode. This is done so we can reduce the length, as well as keep the spotlight on the guest, which is the main purpose of trainer's eyes to begin with. With all that out of the way, let's get started with our first guest. Community building is a word we hear a lot, but the idea of it can be at times daunting and even a challenge. For my very first guest, she not only started both Pokemon Go, but her community as well around the same time as the COVID pandemic. How did she do it? What challenges did she face? Well, there's only one way for us to find out. Allow me to introduce to you an admin of the Pokemon Go Dallas Fort Worth Facebook group and the owner of the City Line Raid Runners, Sam, aka Upbeat Data. Thank you, Sam. Welcome to the show. Hey, hi. How do you feel today? Oh, sorry. I cut you off. Do it again. That's fine. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm feeling a lot better. I've been down with the sickness for the past couple of days and. I'm feeling much better than when I first started. Let's put it that Oof, way. I'm sorry to hear that, but I'm very glad that you're doing better. So that's awesome. well, you know, we've talked about it in private, so this isn't like some private conversation, but you know, I'm glad that you can join the show. I was really looking forward to just being able to bring people who are part of the Pokemon go community and just be able to bring the story on how Pokemon go has came into the lives and how it's affected it over sure. overall. Yeah. And you know, my first question would be is like, before we even get into the Pokemon go part, did you ever play Pokemon even prior to Pokemon Go? So, no. Um, I actually, so I'll give you my only history with Pokemon. Um, I remember being, the answer is no, but I remember being really young and I did like Pikachu. So I know I had a Pikachu stuffed animal at some point, but I remember. So you knew, you knew Pikachu. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I remember being really young and there was something called Pogs. And so I do remember Pokemon Pogs. And then after that, it was, I feel like the generation that kind of grew up with Pokemon was a generation that I babysat for. So um, I know the, the song, the lyrics word for word, because the kids listen to it every single day. So. <laughs> oh, wait, were, were Pogs like that thing where it was like a bottle cap or something yep, like that? Yep, they were little round things. And so they would have different Pokemon on it. And so you just played. I don't know how you actually played Pogs. I just collected them. It was like a collector type thing. So, well, I only knew him. I only knew him because of an episode of Ed, Ed, and Eddie. I don't know if you know that cartoon. Okay, well, there was an episode where it talked like something like that's the only thing I've never heard of Pogs before Uh myself. So that's why I was kind of curious. So, Pokemon came out around, I think, in the U.S. around ninety eight, ninety nine, give or take. So, do you remember what the craze was like 
uh, at that point or is that just kind of where you're more older at the point to where you just weren't interested? Yeah, I was older at that point. Um, and so then my Pokemon Go journey didn't start till way later. And it was actually, I guess if the craze was around 99, it was a little earlier that the show was out that I know the kids that like I was babysitting for were watching it. <laughs> Wow. And what do you think? You just thought it was just too childish at the time that it wasn't just something that you should be into kind of um, thing? I didn't even think about it, to tell you the truth, um, because, I mean, I had no problem with Space Jam. I mean, they watched Space Jam all the time, um, and I would watch Space Jam with them um, ad nauseum. I mean, they watched it on repeat. <laughs> but oh my when Pokemon would come on, can I tell you what I actually remember was the craze about um, parents and saying that it was too the graphics were too much for the kids and making them have seizures and stuff. That was like what I remembered during that time that I was babysitting. And I was like, eh, I don't really have an issue with, with Pokemon's graphics. So. Oh, I didn't actually know about that earlier, but I realized that as I got older, I learned that there was actually some censored episodes, one because of nine yep. 11, but the other one was the uh, seizure one you talked about. And that's actually the Porygon episode. We never got here in the States. Oh, so I didn't know. Yeah, so for those who don't know, and I'm sure you probably don't know either, Sam, um, yeah. there was an actually an episode from Porygon to where there was like a lot of flashing lights. And when it was over in Japan, I believe, there were actually reports of kids getting seizures from the sudden bright lights from the episode. Mm -hmm. So much so that they actually never released the episode officially in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where that whole thing probably came from that you heard about. That's my mm -hmm. guess at this point. And you know what, it, it came over almost like you just said, it was like a game of telephone from when it went to, when it was in Japan, since I don't know, I just know from what you just said, by the right. time it got to the US, it was like, oh my goodness, like there's the scenes and the way that this anime is, um, the graphics, it's making kids have seizures. It was almost as if it was all episodes, the way they were talking. So that's really interesting to hear. Yeah, pretty much so. But anyway, um, so let's get back. Let's go ahead and fast forward a little sure. bit. So we go from 98, 99 to 2016. That's when Pokemon Go officially re uh, released on launch. Yes. Did you, compl you know, on the initial hype train, were you officially hooked on the game at that point? Or was it still a little bit far away from when you entered Pokemon Go? So it came out. I heard about it. Um, I couldn't tell you how. And I thought it sounded really cool because this is still, you know, to me, AR stuff was still really new. And so the fact that you can kind of point your phone around and look for stuff. So I downloaded it and started walking around. The only problem was I was in the middle of nowhere, Texas in 2016. And I'm talking like, when I say I go walk around, I walk up a county road and back and all I see are cows, you know, for like a mile. <laughs> Okay. So I didn't see any Pokemon. Wow. And so, okay. <laughs> um, this went on for maybe about me walking around the block for, you know, a couple times. And then I just put it down and didn't pick it up again until um, 2020. So, but that was my early experience with Pokemon. I wanted to play, but it, it didn't want me to. <laughs> you know, that's crazy because we hear a lot about how people live in these rural areas and i venture out to them um when i go to state parks when it's cooler in texas and there's literally nothing whenever you go mm -hmm. out there like unless you go out there for yourself you literally you literally realize how handicapped or disadvantaged you know more correctly yeah. put that you are in a rural area compared to like in a city and even where we're at oh, right yeah. now like it's night and day absolutely so I you yeah. probably it sounds like you only played for like what maybe a week or two and then just put the game yep. down yeah because i mean it wasn't if there were even pokestops there were none in my game if there were gyms there were none in my game you know so there was there was literally just nothing um there weren't even pokemon so Gosh. Yeah. what was do you remember your starter i don't know if i had to guess though i probably would have picked pikachu but i okay. don't remember but Oh, that's fair. I mean, Pikachu's a fan favorite. We have a mutual friend who was a, uh, obsessed with Pikachu. Yes, yes, we do. And so, how about talking about? So, I believe you're Team Valor, correct? That's the team oh, yeah. you chose. Um, Valor. How about you go into the reason why you chose Team Valor? So, um, when it came to the options of what team to choose, and so I wasn't big into any community at the time, so this was a decision that I kind of just made all on my own. 
um, I thought it was a really cool looking symbol and it reminded me of like the Firebird symbol. And I also love cars, so. But I just thought it was cool looking. Um, the Mystic one didn't really do anything for me and neither did the Instinct. And so it was just Valor all the way. And so, and plus I like red versus blue or yellow, so. Okay, that's fair. Uh, and have you taken a look at the uh, new, I don't know, they call it, this is the Galarian form of Moltres. Have you taken a look at that? I have, and I want it so bad. I just had one run on me the other day, so yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, I wanted oh it. Gosh. I wanted it to stay. I thought that, you know, since I love Valor so much and I want this Moltres so bad, it's going to stay, but it didn't. It ran. Oh, my gosh. Well, maybe the next one will stay around. I'm so hoping... This- is yeah. the Galarian Moltres you're still your favorite out of the three, or do you have maybe a new favorite, just bird-wise? So, I gotta be honest. When it comes to the birds, my favorite is ho No, I'm talking about the Galarian Pokemon. So, Galarian Articuno, oh, Galarian. Moltres, and Zapdos. I agree, yeah. though. I, if, they made, <laughs> if they made a Ho-Ho team, I probably would jump right? shit from Team Mystic. Like, a Team Ho-Ho team, that would be so cool. Like, I love Toho. I love yeah. the bird. I love the phoenix. Phoenix is one yep. of my favorite mythological creatures. Like, I would jump ship if they ever made a team ho-ho for sure. I am right there with you. And I, my, my personal opinion is that it would be orange. I don't know. But that's just what color I think the team would be. But I'm, I'm right with you. I agree 100%. Right, right. But now going yeah. back to the question, though. So, like, out sure. of the new Galarian birds, you know, is that still your favorite Moltres? Or do you prefer the, any of the others? So, no. Articuno is actually the prettiest. That really? is. Yep, that is such a pretty bird. So I've encountered all three. And the Moltres, obviously, I wanted the most. The first one I encountered was Zapdos that I encountered. Um, that was the first to run from me. And then Articuno. And, but that one was just so pretty. Um, the colors, the purple with the green and then the black. Um, and we actually, we have a mutual friend that did an AR with that up against like some waterfalls. But... Um, it was, it's just, it's so pretty. I want it. It's so pretty. It just sound, it looks so, so, I know the one you're talking about, Articuno. It looks so yes. sophisticated. Like it looks like it's at a ball and it just needs right. a tuxedo. <laughs> like one of those, um, I don't know what time period. I'm going to c- completely butcher this, but like 1800 balls where they had the glasses and at the hand, you know, you had to hold it or something like that. Like, right, so, right. That's what, that's the vibes it gives me. I don't know why. No, you're right. That could definitely be. See, I see more as a female, though, as like very glamorous ball gown, kind of flowy. It's just just gorgeous. It's beautiful. Beautiful. I want it. But no, nope. says that. no. Yeah. They say the nay no, my brother. Oh, my gosh. Well, let's go and fast forward to. So when you returned to the game in 2020, do you remember? Uh, was it before uh, the pandemic or after? So when it comes to pandemic babies, I am a Pokemon pandemic baby. Like, you came, you came right when, so you came right when we were shut down and everything happened and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, so, do you want to like the full story of like how I got back into it? Of course. So I'm at work and everything's pretty much shut down. Um, not entirely because obviously I'm still working. Um, but I see a friend of mine and she's like pointing her phone at another friend, but it's not like at the friend; it's like sort of at the floor. And I'm like, what are you doing? And so I look over and I see, like, I could tell what a Pokemon looks like, you know? So I see a Pokemon. I'm like, are you catching Pokemon? And she's like, yeah. And she says she's playing Pokemon Go. And I was like, really? Okay. And she's like, yeah, you should download it. And so I, I mentioned the story, like I previously said, how I played, you know, for a week or two. So I actually ended up downloading it right there. Um, and one of the reasons, too, she was a new mom at the time. And so she would actually um, take Pokemon out when she would walk her baby. And so that's how she would do like her egg hatching and go catch and stuff. And so from there, I downloaded it. And then next thing you know, being someone that works, you know, eight to 12 to however many hours a day, then everything shut down and I needed something to do. Like I needed something to dive headfirst full on into. And that ended up being Pokemon. So I I leveled up pretty quickly after that. (laughs) <laughs> that's pretty awesome and it's a world of difference when you're around a lot of spawns and pokestops compared to being in the role area i imagine yes so i could not believe when so i just happened to move to a place um called city line in richardson and there were stops everywhere there were gyms everywhere and so 
it was something that I'd never seen before. It was all brand new, but I realized how many people in that area have to play because it's also pretty much all new construction. So all those gyms, I mean, I know this now, I didn't know it right when I downloaded it, but I saw the difference because even that day, we were in a little bit more rural of an area um, that day at work. And when I got home, I was like, man, I live like next to two gyms. Like, So for those who don't know, and I did a horrible job introducing this person, uh, Miss Sam is actually the owner of the Richardson City Line group run on both Facebook and Discord. So what City Line is, is actually an area within Richardson, Texas itself. And it's I think it's believed it's mostly apartments, right? And there's parks. Mm-hmm. So it's it's apartments, but what it is, so it's on the line between um Richardson and Plano. Mm-hmm. So Ness, it's like sometimes my Pokemon actually show up as being caught in Plano versus Richardson. So, but there are, yes, um, apartments, parks. But when I say apartments, there's one, two, three, there's like seven apartment complexes in a small area. There's That's a lot small. of apartments in the area. Yeah. Yeah. And there's also uh, shopping centers, right? Yeah. Uh, yep. Not shop. Well, not shopping centers, but you know, like restaurants or stuff like that. Mm hmm. Yep. So Adoku's there. I love their sushi. And then there's Whole Foods and, just a whole series of, of restaurants and basically everyone has a stop. I mean, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, so you got into Pokemon go. So how did the uh, building up the group start? Like when, when did that come into your journey? Well, so the first thing that I thought, um, so you got to kind of picture it. So city line was a very hustle bustle place. There's a lot of people around a lot, a lot of cars around and now it's shut down. There's nobody walking outside. And so what happened was um, I started going out to, to kind of play because, you know, we were shut down. We weren't doing much. So what happened was I realized, okay, so if there's all these gyms here, there's got to be people playing because this is a pretty new area. So I was like, how am I going to find these people? And so how do you find people? Well, you find people a lot of times on Facebook. So I made a Facebook group and it turns out somebody ended up joining the group. I must have shared it in one of the bigger groups, um, like our group, a DFW type group. And somebody joined that lived in my same apartment complex and invited me to a, a, a Discord, which discord was brand new to me i'd never heard of it i didn't know what it is what it does and invited me to the discord group and from there i slowly learned you know what discord was and so then i i had the facebook and started growing that but then made a discord server that was dedicated to the city line area um but in the meantime so the server actually grew out of a chat so we started a chat that was just people who are really hardcore into raiding because that's one of my raiding and Go Battle League are like two of my Pokemon addictions. And we had a chat of about 10 people. And once it started pushing, you know, because you could only have a chat with 10. And so once it started pushing that we needed more people, that's when I started building the server. So when, you, so when you say chatting, you mean like the Facebook chats or? No. We, so we were in a Discord group chat. Oh, gotcha. Okay, gotcha. Yep. Okay, okay. And you could only have, yeah, a total of 10 people. And so it started getting more than 10. And the cool thing is, it was people from all over. So it, it wasn't just like, it was several people from City Line, but then also people from California, people from Australia, just people that were hardcore raiders that I ended up somehow connecting with. Wow. And so the m- amazing part about your group is, you know, I I run a lot, not run, I oversee a lot of the communities. You know, there's a lot of communities who come to my DFW Pokemon Center Discord, and that's how people used to be able to get connected because DFW is so huge. The mm-hmm. one thing I've always noticed is that when people try to start new groups, they usually don't go so well because they either leave it hoping it runs itself, or they get too busy, or they just don't know what they're doing. Now, mm-hmm. what makes your group such an interesting not project, but just a fascination for me is that a you're in a very Richardson's a very active community for Pokemon Go, like it's not like just something that's not been developed. Mm-hmm. But for your group to just grow from that and to be its own little thing is pretty remarkable in my opinion, and it shows how dedicated you are as just a leader and how much you really try to make sure your group is very active and 
it has a community. It has a community of itself. It does, and and I really appreciate that. That's that's very nice of you to say. Um, so when I first got on Discord, I ended up joining some Discords, and I just I didn't feel it, 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 a sense of inclusivity. I didn't feel all that welcome um, to be myself, honestly, and. I realized that, you know, I, I want there to be a community where people can come and almost share ownership. So everybody that joins the Discord, nobody is getting told, you know, that you can't run raids. If if you want your own channel, it's it's someplace that's very democratic. And I think that's really important. Um, and by democratic, I mean, everybody has a say. So people have a voice in that server. So if you ask me why I think it's successful, I think that it has a lot to do with treating people as equals, treating people respectfully. That's actually one of our main rules. And the rule that I really enforce is that be kind. And and I'm not even joking about how strictly I enforce it. Um, yeah, we joke around, we can be sarcastic, we could be funny, but you could tell if somebody's getting snarky, they're they're gonna get a warning, you know, like this. Because why do we all play Pokemon? We we play it for fun. I mean, for me, this is my escape. This is where I go to have fun and kind of let go of my day. So there's no reason for there to be any unhappiness, any negativity, any drama. Let's just make it a fun place where everybody has a voice and everyone can be themselves. So that's that's my goal of the the group. So from what it sounds like, so it's basically positivity. It's being respectful. Yep. And... Um, what other things besides that that you know you want your group to value? What was the other ones? Um, so um, yeah, I mean those are basically it. Um, respectful and and being able to express themselves, being able to be yourself. There we go. Yeah. Expression, expression, yeah. of course. And those that's been what's drived you to make the community to what it is today, it, and probably continue to move them forward. Exactly, and also we have a unique subgroup. So. It goes from, it's all ages. So you could be somebody that's young. You could be maybe 15. We try to maintain a respectful, like I do have a place where we can post, you know, some that's a private little section where you can post some things that are a little more off color. But um, we try to maintain where it is still somewhat, you know, kid friendly. So you could be 15 and be in there, but you could also be 65 and be in there and still feel like you belong. Um, so it's also um, very diverse. Definitely, because I remember I met Danky Do. Uh -huh. um, is that how she says it, right? Danky Do. Um, Danka or um, Danka. Yeah. yeah, I met her because she's from Gun Barrel City, and she's going to be eventually a guest as well. Oh, nice. And she's more of an, you know, she's more of a seniority. Let's put it that yep. way. And it just goes. To, and that's kind of something that kind of got lost because I know you didn't get to experience Pokemon Go prior to, but that's been the fun part about Pokemon Go itself is that it's brought different people from. Different backgrounds, different age groups, yeah. especially ones who maybe wouldn't have been introduced to Pokemon. Because like you said, when you first started, when Pokemon first came out back in 1999, if you were at a certain age, it felt like this is not something I'm supposed to do. Mm, gotcha. And there's always been that stigma. Even I grew up with that when I was uh, still in the Pokemon. I was in middle school. I felt like I'm too young. I'm too old for this, but I still love the game. Yeah. And... That's been the beautiful part about Pokemon Go is that it's allowed people to kind of same values as you did. It allows them to express themselves, express this interest in the game. In spite of it only coming out for when it was for little kids, it's for everybody. Yeah. It really is. And, and I, yeah. it's, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, I absolutely, I love combating that stigma. I love saying to people like, like one, what's one of your hobbies? If they ask me, I'm going to put Pokemon Go and if they ask me about it, I'm going to talk about, you know, this community. I mean, I just had recently a, a community day get together. And this is like the majority of my friends, you know, especially being and a good chunk of us are not from Texas. So it's people that you really wouldn't have anybody to, you know, you don't necessarily like, like my childhood friends are back in New York. So you may not have, you know, your childhood friends near you or even people to go and hang out with. And now I've got this like booming, you know, community of people that we have real get togethers, you know, I mean, and we're all just just regular people having fun playing a game. Um, so I think it's important to get rid of that stigma. So I, 
I share openly and proudly that I am a Pokemon Go player. So, well, that's good to hear. I had a little trouble getting to that point, but it finally took a friend. She said, I like what I like. And when she said that, I'm like, I can get with that. Yeah. And eventually I got to the point where I'm okay with, well, now I'm definitely okay with saying it, but that's the fun part about Pokemon Go. But, you know, going back to just with regards to building a community, like, Say, for example, somebody doesn't know how to start a community or they don't really have people who play the game, you know, what would you recommend to them to do to be able to build a community up or to start one or, you know, from your own personal experience? So what I think is um, if, if there's something that that you want to do, right? So let's say you're in an area and you're like, you know, I want people to raid with. I, I just say go ahead and start. Um, I think that that's all, always the hardest part. I don't think you have to plan it out. When I started, it was only a few months after I even first learned what Discord was. So you can learn as you go. You could literally start with just a chat in, in a server, and, and you could go from there. So to anybody that's wanting to start a group, um, the first thing I would say is is start, you know, and then figure out how you want to invite people. The next thing I would say is one thing you do have to plan for and know is how you are going to lead that group. So I, I think you need to make your rules. What, what, are the, what are the principles and what are the rules that you wanna run this group by? Um, so I think that that's an important part. And if, if you go into um, my server, I actually, I, I kinda wanna read it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Maybe, but but that's one of the things that I think is is really important is is knowing what your goal is, but not procrastinating. Just start. So gotcha. And that's some very good details because I think a lot of people think that you have to be this very notable person, but really just the act the idea of just starting something and seeing where it goes is mm -hmm. a, enough to really get a community going. Like when I started this podcast, I had no idea how to do a podcast. I still sometimes don't know what I'm doing. But it's one of those things to where you learn as you go, you add on to things and like you build ideas from other things you see from other servers, like what you talked about earlier. I see things from other podcasts that I'm like, I want to add something like that to my podcast. Now, I don't copy it straight for word, word for word, but I incorporate it in some way that it reflects who I am. And it comes out that way in the same way with your Discord community, like you find things that you like that you see other places and you bring it in and you incorporate your own idea to it, right? Yeah, exactly. And I actually, on that topic, I always give a huge shout out to the Richardson Rocket server. Um, and, and we could probably share more info about that, but, and also Pogo Badger. Um, because looking at the Rocket server, after I made my server and started joining different discords, I sort of saw the direction I wanted to take it in. And there were some really great examples and it was from that Richardson rocket server. So I definitely encourage people to check it out. Um, because yeah, you see things and you're like, you know what? I think that would be a good idea in my server as well. So that's, that's a group that I enjoy being a part of. And, and also another thing that I think is really big is how you treat people when they ask questions and in that server and also something I strive to do in my server, I never felt less than when I was asking questions. Cause you know, people are like, Oh, I've got a stupid question. Like, no, you know, I mean, it depends, it really depends on who's, who's answering it, you know, how you feel. And people were very knowledgeable, very welcoming and really made me feel like it was okay to ask questions um, in that server. And so that's also something that I brought along into my server um, and creating it was, the way that they were very welcoming and, and answering in questions. Definitely. And, and that's one thing I learned when I started, uh, when I was taking ownership of the Facebook group, and I've talked about this before, like, you know, I've played this game from day one. I've, I've been mm -hmm. upfront about that since I started this. The one thing that I had to take a step back from, and I've always encouraged other people to do it who's played this game, is that not everybody plays this game as much as I did, or has come at the same point in the game as I did. What I mean is you're a prime example you came in 2020, right when the pandemic was happening. You probably had the quest where you had to catch a ditto. You probably had the quest where you had to evolve a Magikarp, right? Yeah. And, uh, yep. and I was always one of those snobby elitists. And I'll, I'll hold it probably because that's part of my history. 
to where I'm like, why are we still talking about this? We should all already have it because you have to step back and view it as a time frame to where people come into the game differently. They come in and out and you have to have that patience to where not everybody's going to be where yep. I'm at. And I think that's, that would be the, that was the biggest challenge for me. Cause I had to kind of get my head out of the, you know, what to be able to kind of humble myself and be able to share the stuff that I have gained and to be able to make me more approachable as well as me more to be more welcoming to people who come into this community. Yeah. And I, I think honestly, you know, you, you made a really good decision, not trying to do my own, but, you know, asking me to come and help admin that group, which thank you. But also I'm someone that I could be on the same steps as they are, or it's something that I've recently completed. So I kind of see where they're coming from a little bit better, you know, than as if I had been playing since 2016. So I think that that's something that I personally have found looks like it's helpful to the group. Um, so yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, since you've, since you've had to manage the uh, city line group, what's been the biggest challenge you think so far? Um, my main challenge is if we do run across somebody that's, that's joined, that's being a little, um, um, snarky, uh, or not really promoting our, our, I, I guess I would call it almost like, a, I know I'm using some of these terms, but like a core culture is that kindness. Um, and so having to do any sort of confrontation has been a challenge for me since, I mean, I've got a mod group and we've got a group of moderators, but I'm usually the one once we make the decision that's going to reach out to the person and say, hey, you know, this is something going on that we we kind of, you know, can you please not not do this or, or kind of not talk to people this way? So that's been, that's a challenge for me personally. Um, the only other challenge is is actually just see just as it grows, growing with it, you know, and, and making sure that you have built a server that can grow. And so when I first built it, my goal was for it to be worldwide rating, like to have people from all over. So I tried to build it to anticipate growth. So that that's challenging that as more people join, you kind of got to make more space almost. <laughs> so you feel like, like when you say growing with the server, do you feel like you may hold it back to what it could become? Or do you mean like, um, like, can you expand on that idea? Yeah, sure. So things like having role assignment, um, things like, so role assignments where you, you know, you can click and get and have auto roles. That's something that I had to learn how to do. Um, so that way you're not the one assigning people to different roles. People can check it and uncheck it. Um, but also to have a place where you're growing to the point that you've got multiple raids going on in multiple chats, uh, uh channels and for people to be comfortable doing that and not kind of how to not step on each other's toes and just kind of work around that. So that kind of growth. I got you. That makes sense. We're very, so, very raid heavy. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm guessing you use a lot of the remote raid passes, I guess. Is that where a lot of the rating comes from at the moment? Yeah. Um, I mean, so my, my, one of my goals when I first started the server also was to have a place where people can be able to raid 24 seven. Cause I can be sort of a night owl. And it's hard when raid, raids end at 9 p.m. Because it could be 1 in the morning and I want to raid. Well, the good news is that at 1 in the morning, my time, people are waking up in Sweden. Or it's afternoon in Australia. So we do have people that are in the group that you can ask, like, hey, you got any raids over there? Um, and so that's been a really helpful thing. Sam, you want a fun fact? Sure. So can, uh, I'll, I'll leave you with a question. Sure. How long do you think we've had raids go until nine o'clock? Oh, how long? Let me guess. Since COVID started, <laughs> close. Okay. We only had it for I think a year before COVID happened. Before that, raids would end at seven. Wow! Oh my God, this sounds miserable for people that. It was miserable. I think. Yeah. I, I think it's a year. It's a year, year and a half around that time. We haven't had it nine o'clock curfew for a while. Yeah. Before COVID happened. And other than that, our raids would normally end at seven o'clock. God, how boring. That's so early. <laughs> it was very early. It was very frustrating. Like we were like, we want to continue raiding, but eventually yeah. they moved it. It's technically nine thirty, but yeah. But that right. was the yeah. most frustrating right. part that raids would end so early for the longest yeah. time. 
yeah and, and that's that's another part of um the group that i love is that you can be someone that works nights and you could still come raid on your lunch break like someone might be raiding at three in the morning like it's not going to be every day but you can say hey anybody got any raids we have somebody that regularly posts um you know when it's aussie raid hour they say hey aussie raid hour if anyone's down and we've got a lot of people from california that it'll still be you know around 10 p.m for them and so they're down. They're like, yeah, let's do Aussie Raid Hour, you know? So that's something that I think is really great that, that you can still keep going. Basically, like I said, 24-7. Have you uh, considered what's going to happen once the remote raid nerf kicks in? Like how that's going to affect your group at all? I haven't um, for the main reason. So there, there's two reasons. One, it's such a cash cow for Niantic. <laughs> I mean... When you think of how much money they are making off remote raids, and also, I feel like it's really bringing people together. So I, I'd like to tell a, a quick story. I don't know how they found me, but I had two people. Um, I'll call one Tuss and the other's Crispy Wags. But we would always invite one another to raids. And I had no clue where they were from other than where their gifts come from. So one gifts came from New Zealand, one came from Sweden. Um, and next thing I know, somehow Tuss's wife finds me on Discord or on Facebook. I have no clue how somebody, yes, by my Pokemon Go name. And I've got nothing Pokemon Go on my Facebook. But somehow she found me and she says, hey, Tuss is my husband. I'd love to read with you too. Um, can you please add me? And so now I have her also, her and her, her husband are both friends. But I mean, we are we are close friends. Like I may Aww. actually go to Sweden and visit them. That's how often we talk and like how close friends we. Are. <laughs> so it's bringing people together throughout the world. Now, if I couldn't remote invite or be remote invited to those raids, that never would have happened. So I so that's the first reason why I don't think I, I just don't see it immediately happening. Now, if it does. I'm also down for that too, because then we'll go back to the raid trains where, you know, you're all in your cars or you get in a van together and you drive around and raid. Um, so you got to experience that actually a little bit. Yes. Well, I actually, I, yeah, I experienced it a little bit before the real shutdown came. Um, and then now that everyone's been vaccinated, we're able to kind of do it again. So I have been doing some in-person raids. Um or most people are, are vaccinated, but I, I still think that it would be a sad thing if it does happen. So Niantic, I hope that you don't nerf um, remote raids because they do bring people together. That's been the hardest part because, you know, at first I was like, I'm ready for these nerfs to come because it kind of killed the in-person to a degree. But yeah. then I've seen some good online groups that yep. run really well. And I always talk about the ones, uh, Evolve is what their name is. They, they're based around EV Evolutions. They're one of the mm -hmm. best ones I've met because they literally not only encourage remote raiding, they also teach people how to host raids. And I'm mm -hmm. always a fan when people teach one another because that's how we grow together. Yeah. And a lot of people, oddly enough, it's a bit of a challenge to host a raid. In spite of it being easy for me and you, but me and you, we have experience. I'd people, actually, yeah, go ahead. go ahead. I'd love to touch on that more, but go ahead. Yeah. No, go ahead. That's what I was about to uh, transition towards. Sure. Um, that that's one of my um huge things so i actually recently somebody joined the server and hosted a raid and so what i did was i went and made a little medal to give them you know first raid hosted because people don't realize what a challenge that is and yep. so i want people to know it's as big of a deal as it is it and really so I, is yep and that's yeah. that's the issue we ran into with in-person raids because everybody would lean towards the natural leader because we had raid leaders Yep. And literally they realize is that they really could do it themselves. They just need mm -hmm. to kind of build that confidence to do it. And that's, that's where what you just said is where my be kind comes in. If that person messes up, nobody is going to hold it against them. Even if they lose a raid pass, nobody, I mean, our goal is to let that person try and, you know, try, succeed. I have had so many times where I've messed up raids. I still mess up raids, and I can't even tell you, I mean, how many I've hosted at this point, but I'm still but messing up. I mess up stuff because of my antics, so I mean, I'm no different. 
Right, right. But the thing is, and so that's part of why having an inclusive environment and having that be kind rule is so important because you can't, if someone is going to take that leap and host a raid for the first time and not feel supported, that's, I think, the easiest way to turn somebody off, to get somebody to no longer raid again, you know, or host a raid, not no longer raid again, but, but host raids is if you turn around and say, oh, thanks a lot. I lost the pass. You know, you got to be supportive of that person. Just to touch and, on that, that's one thing yeah. I hope that, you know, I know eventually it will be nerfed at some point. Like, I don't, pers- I mean, I don't know, I could be wrong, but if they do, I hope the communities that are already established really kind of find a way to promote that idea of being able to help people who don't have the confidence to host raids or to lead or to even just post a raid, be able to do it. Because once you get community more involved and everybody can do it, it becomes so much better. It doesn't always come down to one or two guys or three, I'm sorry, one or two yep. people or three people. It can be something that everybody can enjoy. Yep. So I'm hoping that eventually communities more become more adaptable for that. Yeah. And, and I, I think that we're poised to do that. So that's actually something that you just brought up. And, you know, I mean, there, there are people that are here in DFW, should it, you know, happen that, that there aren't remote raids. But we have people from every level. I mean, you could be level 30 and host a raid. You could be level 50 and host a raid. Um, and, and it's basically the same. You know, you're going to be supported. And generally, unless I'm at work, I'm going to be there watching. And I'm going to watch for anybody <laughs> making any off comments. But if you're someone that's never wanted to or, or been afraid to host a raid, come on over because host all you want. I mean, we have everybody's welcome to do it. Nobody is going to shame you for any mistakes. It's just a very, you know, a, a place where you can you can go ahead and try that first thing and everyone's going to be supportive of you. The word I'm thinking of is empowerment. That's the word I was trying to think of. I was yeah. like, There's a word <laughs> for this that I'm thinking of and I'm just drawing a blank. But so is it safe to say that rating is your favorite part of a Pokemon Go? It tied with Go Battle League. Oh, so you do PvP? Yes, it's did, one of one of my yep. Mm-hmm. What did uh did you start right away, or how, what got you involved in the PvP? So that actually did uh, start pretty much right away. Um, the friend that I told you about that got me into um, my friend Ashley that got me into Pokemon Go. She um, one day I'm at home and she's like, "Do you want to battle?" And I'm like, "Oh, we could battle each other, like from me to to you." And I've got a competitive streak. <laughs> So, oh, so it's the same friend that uh, played Pokemon Go with you at the in the work job you were at? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. And so she wasn't a very high level. Obviously, I was brand new. So I was just up to the level where you can, what is it, level seven where you can, or after five where you choose a team. Um, yep. Yeah, level five. Yep. Yep. So we battled one another um, and I lost. And then I was like, oof, I did not like that because <laughs> I don't like losing. <laughs> so then we battled again and I lost. Then I, you know, did a little bit of research, battled again, I won. Then I went up against her husband, I won. <laughs> and I was like, ooh, I like this winning thing. And that's when I realized that there's a Go Battle League, because obviously when you start researching battles, that's the first thing that's going to come up in, like, Google. And so I started PvP, and I learned the hard way. Um, you just take the punches, and you lose over and over and over until you win. And yeah, then, Go ahead, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, no, you you just learn what it what it's what you got to do to win, what it takes to win, and so that's I basically. Gonna, what I was going to ask if you had any uh, content creators PVP you like to watch or anything that kind of taught you. So, most. Um, the first, so first of all, I'm going to say um, uh, his name's Fuss Bomb. Um, he was recently number one. I reached out to him earlier in the days of PVP. We we somehow became friends through you know being both in Richardson, um, where I believe we were both there. And he gave me some PvP advice, and I that's some of the best advice I've ever received. Um, when I started watching videos, which I almost did not want to, because I felt like watching the videos in my head was almost like I liked my way, my way of just getting beat down until you figured out what the right thing to do was. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Versus having somebody tell you what the right thing to do is. But um, it's a content creator called um, Zionic. And so he's, he's one of the first ones that I started watching. 
Um, and then there's also, I was recently, there's two more. I might have to check on their names real quick. Um, but one P is one, one is called FP sticks, I believe. Yeah. Zionic FP sticks. And there's one other, um, but FP sticks was recommended to me, um, by fuss. And I think that that's a really great recommendation. Um, and so those are the two creators that I watch on YouTube, but I don't watch them that much because I still prefer my my getting kicked down until you know how to get up way <laughs> of PvP. So that's fair. We all got our ways how we want to learn everything. So with you being involved with PvP and rating, so do you have any goals in Pokemon Go at the moment? Something you're kind of working towards or anything like that? Yeah. So when it comes to um PvP, my biggest goal is to get to veteran. Uh well actually I should say my biggest goal is to eventually get to legend. That's that's what I want to do. Um, but right now I've made it to ace and I've gotten kind of close to veteran, almost like halfway there. But my next big goal is is to hit veteran and I'll be jumping up and down and screaming like I did when I hit ace. <laughs> so is it a challenge to get to that level? Um, it really is. So once at least for me, and it's it's different for everybody because everyone's got their own league. I feel like they accelerate at. So some people are best at Great League, Ultra League, Master League, or some of the special cups. And so I had a friend who very easily, he was great at Master League, so he got right to veteran. I am not somebody who's put in the the really trade time, honestly, to get good PvP stats on a Master. Um, I'm not someone that's that's put in that time to have a really good Master League team. But in my experience, I've hit Ace, and so then you start dropping in rank. <laughs> And next thing you know, you're going up against people that are level 20, level 19. <laughs> what you want to be doing is going up against people that are higher than you. So that shows that you're doing well and you're getting closer to veteran. So for me, I get there and then I kind of start falling back down and then you got to work your way back up. And it's it's a challenge. It's it's rough for me sometimes to get that. Oh, I just dropped down to 1907 when I was just at 2000, you know. So it's it's tough. Well, very cool. I'm glad that you know you found your niche in PvP, and hopefully someday it's the legend you're trying to get to, right? Yeah. So legend is the highest when you get the really cool, awesome pose, um, and I'm I'm confident I'll get there. So it took me about a year to get to ace from when I first started, and so now I'm on year two, and well, maybe not a year, maybe a little more, year and a half, um, and so now I'm I'm confident that you know over the next year or two I'll I'll learn more about building teams. Another thing that it really comes down to in being so new, you've got people who've been stockpiling dust. And so there are people out there with 23 million stardust. Right now, I've got 300,000. You want to know why? Because I recently powered up a group, a team. <laughs> and so if you're someone who's powering up teams, you've got no dust. So that's been a big disadvantage. Yeah, too. Dust, the dust struggle is always real. I'm guessing you're looking forward to the... Uh... The executive could be day, right? Oh, yeah. Heck, yeah. I'll be doing that all day long. <laughs> yep. And I'll, yep. I'll be having my star piece going. And I look forward to anything. I check every event and see if it's double dust. So that way I know what I need to do. <laughs> well, let's go ahead and transition towards uh, the ambassador program, which you said you've kind of took an interest in pursuing. What are your thoughts on it uh, from what you've get, from what you've read so far? So I'll tell you my main thought. My main thought is... Um, it said cool promos and cool swag for your community. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I read that, I said, you know, I would like, I'll do anything to, to be able to reward the, the community. And I, I call them almost after everything that I host, like the greatest group of raiders in the world, because it's just, like I said, if you, if you foster that type of environment, you just end up with such an amazing group of people. And like you mentioned, um, Danka uh, or Danka do how she, however she pronounces it, but she's someone who's thanked me from the beginning for being, you know, and again, not trying to toot my own but being open, being welcoming, being inclusive, you know, those type of things. And so I feel like all these people, and now they are shooting up in level and watching people get shinies and watching people just enjoy the game and love the game. So I want to reward them with cool Niantic swag. <laughs> So, the, but also um, one of the reasons too, when it comes to the idea of being an ambassador would be, this is again, what I do for my cooling off time, my fun time. I mean, I, I've got a very stressful day job that I want something that's just 
having a good time and hanging out with people that share my interests. And so the idea of hosting community get togethers where that's what you do, you get together and share your interests. I really like that. And the idea of, you know, kind of Niantic rewarding you and your community for that. So that's the reason why I'm interested in it. Very much so. It's a very interesting program when I read about it. And I'm hoping that it goes well and it gets people who have already invested in the community for the past couple of years and maybe because mm-hmm. it's weird right now where we're at because I've because, you know, we're coming from post COVID. You've got people like how, you know, you yourself actually right. are just one of them who all they know is the online scene or they, they just know the uh, COVID buffs, the remote rating. That's how they know it. You've got some people who beforehand who remember the in-person rates, right. myself would probably be included in that, who remember driving around or some people who would just be mm-hmm. in parks randomly or, you know, yada, yada, yada. And it's just a very odd divide right now with the community to where I'm curious to see how this program maybe unites and hopefully maybe rebrands the community to what it is. It might not go to what you knew what it was like. It might not go to what I was like, but some kind of odd, maybe hybrid, and so you will. And open to it. I'm not I'm not so stuck in my ways that I think I think that they had a great game before. I think they've made some good, and this is just from what I've heard, um, but I think they've made some really good, you know, maybe remote raids, maybe they don't nerf them completely, but maybe you you could do them once a day or once a week. You know, I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm totally open to the hybrid thing. And I think more in person, I mean, in person get togethers are great, but we are still, I mean, I, I don't like when people say post COVID and I just have to mention that because we're not post COVID yet. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I'm our prime example right here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And so, you know, I think that they still need to take into account that we can still have another outbreak. And it's it's not me trying to, you know, be fearful. I'm being realistic. You know, I work in healthcare and I'm being realistic. Like it's it's very, you know, it's likely. So I think a hybrid would be good if they come up with that. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. you know, we're towards the end of, you know, your time here on the show. You know, my last question is, you know, have you ever thought about maybe what life would be after Pokemon Go? Or, like, what would cause you to finally maybe put the game down? Have you ever kind of given that any thought at all? So, it's it's something where I've, I have such a good time playing and I enjoy everyone. Um, I know that how tight the community has gotten and how close some people are that no matter what, whether it's Pokemon Go that unites us or whether it's just our friendship that it could just now be our friendship, you know, kind of bringing us together. So I'm not terribly worried about an after Pogo, but I also feel like I just, I don't see it happening right away. I just really, I feel like there's a huge group of people and they're, they still come every day. I hear people that are like, I just picked the game back up. Can you help me out? You know, so it's it's still happening every day. And what did Niantic do? What was it like a billion? Not last year, but the year before. I mean, a lot of money. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a lot of money. So, um, I I don't see a life after Pogo. But what I do know is that when it happens, if it happens, that it's a life with a lot of friends that I did not have before. Um, and and it and those friends are going to continue to be strong friendships, whether we're playing this game or not. Well, very cool. Um, anything else you want to add at all? So actually, yeah, um, the quote that I mentioned before, <laughs> I kind of <laughs> just want to throw it in because it's something that when people are introduced to my server, that it's the first thing you read. Um, really? Okay. So the, whenever they introduce the server, they get a message with this quote? Well, it's part of when, you, when you're when you agreeing to the rules. Okay. Gotcha. And so it's from Meowth. <laughs> oh, um, I love this one. I think I know this one. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, we do have a lot in common, the same earth, the same air, the same sky. Maybe if we started looking at what's the same instead of always looking at what's different, well, who knows? And so I think that that's a really great way of how Pogo has brought communities together and, you know, the community that, that I run and the way people are brought together despite so many differences in occupation and nationality and language. Um, so I love it. I love looking at what's the same versus what's different. So the thing about that quote is that, so when Pokemon first movie came out, it was actually not well received because people thought it ended very weirdly. 
but it was it's one of those movies that aged very well ah. because that quote is speaks more about more present day than it did back in the day in my opinion but i love that quote and i didn't realize that existed until i had to rewatch it when i was way older interesting yeah i came across it online just just in looking at stuff and i was like man that's fabulous so it's going to be basically like one of the foundations of you know how we treat each other here yeah and that's all I have for today. Thank you all for joining me for the episode of As the Pokeball Turns and the very first episode of the segment Trainer's Eyes. As I said, these episodes will be in brackets and in all caps as more episodes are released. If you are interested in checking out Upbeat Data's community, a Discord link will be placed in the show notes of this podcast, so feel free please to check it out. Just a reminder, you can also subscribe to this podcast on Apple, Spotify, or your podcast streamer of choice. If you want to listen to more, please check out my other episodes. You can also follow me on Twitter at the first Hamtaro. The first is the one ST, and I'll see you all next time.